Thank you all for tuning in. The following is a presentation of Bald Spots Productions. Be sure to like, comment, and share. You know, subscribe, follow, whatever it is you've got to do to kick that algorithm into gear and help us reach more people. Yes, it is I, your humble host, Bill Hatch the Third, coming to you live from the palatial remote studios of Bald Spots, Bald Spots Productions here in the beautiful city of Branson, Missouri. Um, I have come for uh, for a bit of uh, Sabbath rest and uh, schoolwork um, and some fun. We've, uh, we've definitely been having some fun, which is part of Sabbath rest because you should enjoy that. But, uh, um, but yes, uh, we are going to start with an opening prayer. So uh, would you care to take us, uh, take us there? Without the introduction, I certainly would. Let us pray. <laughs> Gracious Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would guide us through today's study. Help us to understand the personalities of the Bible that we'll be looking at today and help us to see how they, they relate to us even now. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen indeed. Amen. Well, when we left off, we were talking about Gideon in the book of Judges and, uh, and all the things he did, um, both good and bad. And uh, today we're going to conclude uh, with a little bit of Judges and uh, going to get into, uh, into our first woman of the Bible that we're talking about. Well, we did talk about Eve. We've talked about a couple of we've, we've talked, but this is the first in depth. This is the first one that has an entry in the book. Oh, okay. Her own entry in the book, that is. <laughs> she has her book within a book. Yes, her book within the book. And uh, and we'll get into, uh, probably get into Samuel and talking about him and David and Saul and all of those good people. But first, I think we have time for a Rudy Minute. Hi, everybody. I love you all. Waka, waka, waka with the Lord. Uh, I, John the Baptist asked, was Jesus the one to come or we should wait for someone else? And he already knew, and he had the Holy Spirit of God, and he knew that Jesus was coming. And he was already in God's time. And us, we're not in God's time. We go by faith. So we got to remember, even John the Baptist that knew, that, well, Jesus' cousin knew that he was coming, and so, and he would, he saw him. So you know that we have doubts sometimes. But see, a lot of times we have doubts when we're going through bad situations. Like, uh, you know, things happen. And and it's true, God is not a genie, because Bill the Third has told me that before, that Jesus is not a genie. But sometimes we act like it. We say, God, Jesus, I want a motorcycle that's blue and is beautiful. I want it, but it's up to God if he wants to give it to me or he doesn't. But we got to go by the yeses and the noes. So remember, everybody, sometimes we want things or we think God is a genie and he's not. And just love him no matter what happens. Because in time, God will give us wives. God will give us what we need. God will give us food. So please be patient. And we go by God's time. And I love you all. Waka waka with the Lord. And please let me have that motorcycle. Thus saith the Lord, not yet. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, I am and I can give absolutely positive vibes to. Uh, I don't know about you, Bill, but Rudy's just given a whole sermonette here, and yep. uh, we could talk all hour on just on what he was what he was in. Yeah. Primarily, it's the fact that John the Baptist was in jail at the time that he sent those uh, disciples out to Jesus because he was depressed. And he was very concerned if he had made a mistake. Isn't that true of all of us? You know, we have things when we say, did we really do this? Should we have really done that? Well, that's a whole sermon, and I don't really want to get to it. Right. Uh, not today. For those of you who may be new to the show or just want to remember, we're working from the Dear God book by Catherine Sl Slattery. And currently talking about judges, or we left off doing judges with Gideon. She does, by no means covers all of them. Uh, 
She didn't cover Deborah, as I recall. No. And that was certainly a big uh, judge listing because it was female. I want to give one more that's not really a judge, but shows a particular story that we need to be aware of in this day and age still. And that's the fact that it starts off in chapter 18. Actually, it's pretty much <laughs> pretty much all in 18 for the importance. But we have a Levite from Judah, and he decides to go out and find a better place to uh, be a working Levite. There was nothing wrong with that. It's stated by Moses, uh, well, from God through Moses, that Levites could go out. They were given um, many different cities of their own, but other communities they knew would grow up and need Levites. And so he goes off on his own. Uh, he finds an individual whose name was Micah, who the story in chapter 18 says that he took as in stole shekels of silver from his mom. And when she pronounced a curse openly on whoever stole it, he brought it back to mom. And mom said, oh, what a good boy you are. And she gave him four shekels of that silver to make an idol. And Micah set up this idol and uh, started, you know, having his own little priestum. Mm -hmm. That's really the way to say it until this Levite who's wandering from Judah comes and they meet and lo and behold, Micah hires him to be his priest. And more of the story goes on that this was earlier than the end of Judges would indicate because we're told it's before Dan, the tribe of Dan had a place to live. They were not able to overthrow the part of the allotment that Moses, God, designated for them. And anyway, they finally end up going to Laish, but they find Micah and the priest and the idol and they overthrow them. <laughs> now this, this Levite is doing double bad duty because he's not supposed to be a priest. And then on top of it, he's being a priest for an idol. So, there, there's kind of a, a double whammy here. So uh, yes. God, God's really not happy with this guy uh -huh. right now. Okay. And, well, it even gets worse because we have, if I can say it correctly, after the Danites overthrow the area that they're going to finally get to move into, they settle themselves and the idols. And if the priest's name finally comes up at the end of the chapter, it's Jonathan, the son of Gershon the son of Moses. And the descendants of Moses were not to be the priest. It was the descendants of Aaron. So he literally is setting up his own little kingdom within the kingdom. We see that in modern times. Uh, the Mormon church did it when Joseph Smith died. A group of his family set up their own worship of Mormonism, and then the major part followed uh, Brigham Young. But they're not the only ones who do that. If you look in uh, to church history, you'll see that every religious group has splits in their denominations or in their movements. I belong to the Church of God out of Anderson, Indiana now. When they formed, they didn't even want to be called a denomination. They wanted to be called a movement. I was a hospital chap, not the best choice of terms. Uh, means a whole different thing. But nonetheless, we see those kinds of divisions. And this is important to see that, one, it's really much earlier in the time of the judges than chapter 18 would appear to be. But also the fact that too many people want to set up their own religious beliefs. And we're told that that idol worship and apparently the descendants of Jonathan, the grandson of Moses, went all the way up to the time of the deportation to Babylon. Not good at all. There is no record of when this idol was destroyed. 
like there were other uh, idols that were destroyed by uh, Josiah, mm -hmm. who's the last king, but I'm now getting ahead of myself and I don't want to. But it's important to look at all of the stories of the judges and to be able to say, wow, it took a long time to get there. Yes, it, they're not in chronological order. We do not know if there were even more judges. You brought that up yeah. earlier yeah. to me. Yeah, there, there, there could have been. We don't know for certain how, what percentage of the judges that actually were are in, included in the book of Judges. Yes. Um, we just have really no way to know other than tradition. And this and example that. in Judges 18 is not a judge at all. Right. He's a Levite who became a priest, and that's why it's good for us to read these different stories. Yeah. Some of them are not pretty. No. Um, and that's all I'll have to say <laughs> on it. Yes, just uh, remember to uh, to read through the book of Judges because there are some really interesting stories. There's some real soap opera kind of stuff going on. Oh. Um, but uh, And uh, you can always uh, scroll down and find the series we did on Judges on, uh, on the All Approachable Bible Study for All. Um, we did that a while back uh, as part of our preparation for Matthew, which we're doing now. Not right now, maybe. But on Tuesday, we're going to move on to, I believe, a very important book of the Old Testament for us. Uh, I believe in, in the whole Bible, being able to read and learn from it is paramount in our Christian walk. Even though it's Old Testament before Christ, it is part of our Christian walk. The book is Ruth. Ruth, by the way, means friend. Hmm. So if you know anyone named Ruth, just call her friend, and uh, then you can explain that that's what Ruth means. And that's actually fun to be able to do that. Nonetheless, Ruth was a Moabite. She was not Jewish. No. Uh, we are told that a man from Benjamin and his wife and two sons left Judah during a time of famine and went to Moab. Not Utah. Not, not Moab, Utah. Oh, okay, not Moab, Utah. Right. Very funny. Uh, point being is, is that God had really forbidden the Israelites from doing anything with Moab. If you were a, if you were a Moabite and wanted to participate in religious services at the temple, you couldn't even get into the common court. They were supposed to be excluded. And that, yes, there is something about 10 generations, and some scholars have tried to say, well, if you mark everything down, that's 10 generations. I don't think so. <laughs> but that's okay. Emelech, who is the Jewish individual, and Naomi, his wife, went with their two sons into Moab to try to survive the drought that was going on, drought famine. Even though it was against the rules, it was in those days, every man did what was right in his own eyes. Uh, so they ignored that part of God's stuff. Well, while they were in Moab, Naomi turns around and uh, decides to come back to Israel because Judah has gotten out of their part of the famine. And she tries to encourage her daughter-in-laws to return to their own family. One of them does, and one doesn't. One who doesn't is Ruth. And Ruth, which means friend, really describes her. Naomi again tries to tell her, you know, go home, her my daughter. Her. You know, you need, I can't do anything for you. Can't replace the sons for you so you can marry one of them. <laughs> Be outlandish. Uh, but Ruth says, no, wherever you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. She's really a friend, and that's the way she acts towards her mother-in-law. I suppose there's a whole thing about how you react to mother-in-laws. I had great in-laws. Uh, at times, I wonder if my wife Eileen had great in-laws or not. There were some rough patches in there, nonetheless. But still, we were able, you know, in-laws are in-laws. But Ruth treats Naomi almost like... I don't know, like a mother to a daughter instead of a daughter to a mother-in-law. She's really very faithful. They go back. 
they take up residence in their house, which was their house. And, well, read the story of Ruth. Ruth goes out and she does so much for uh, getting food for herself and her mother-in-law. At one point, she even takes home a shared lunch, which really shows how much she cared. Yes, we would call them leftovers, but it was like, hey, Naomi, here's food. It's already been roasted. Yep. And she gets to eat that. And anyway, Ruth ends up being married to Boaz. Boaz is a member of Emelech's tribe. And he does for them a lot of things. And they have a child who ends up being the grandfather of David. Right. If you go to the first chapter of Matthew, you can read it on your own, it's verses 1 through 18, it talks about the genealogy of Jesus, and you will find Ruth right there in the middle. Actually, if you look, there are four females listed in the genealogy, and you cannot prove that any of them were Jewish. And that's important, like I said, for us, because we are not Jewish either, but we are part of the family of God because we are spiritual descendants of Abraham. But sure enough, David is a great grandson of uh, Naomi, if I got my generations correct, it's just one great. I think, so. I think it's one great. Uh, it might be two greats, but it's in, you can figure that out if you like. <laughs> and which, which is which is why the Book of Ruth is included was originally included in the Bible, at least the human reason. God's reason, of course, is to uh, is different, and uh, and you'll find out that as you read the Book of Ruth um, for yourself. But uh, um, was because the reason why people put it in was because Ruth was a Moabite and the grandmother of David, who was the king. And people didn't want the, the, the people in charge of, uh, of the Old Testament um, <laughs> didn't want the people of Israel to, to rebel against David because he was technically not to be allowed in the temple, which wasn't a problem since there wasn't a temple yet, but into the presence of God. Um, so into the tent of meeting and, and all that, he would have been excluded if, uh, if they had stuck with the letter of the law, um, which is another important, uh, important lesson for us is that, and this is something that Jesus uh, um, talks about extensively, and uh, especially when you see him uh, bad-mouthing the Pharisees is they were going so much with the letter of the law, they forgot the spirit of the law. Amen. And the spirit of the law is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and all your neighbors as yourself. All the neighbors. All the neighbors. Even the Moabites who had been so nasty to them to start mm -hmm. and supposed to be excluded, we see that that exclusion did have exceptions, even as we find other exceptions throughout the Bible. What jumps into mind particularly is you should be baptized. Yeah. Thief on the Christ cross was not baptized. Right. And I do not believe that he was sent in paradise, as Jesus said, that he'd be sent to hell after that. Right. He would go on, he would go on and is in heaven today without being baptized. Well, so there. Now that's a whole Different topic I don't want to get into. Yep. Because these are things that we learn and go forward. But Ruth happily is part of the genealogy of Jesus, and it shows to what extent. The other three, and I'm only touching on them briefly, was Judah's daughter-in-law, Tamar, who was not Jewish, because there really wasn't a Jewish line for Judah to marry. Uh, she's not there. The next one is Rahab from the time of Joshua. And there's quite a bit of controversy on, on that lady. Most translations say she was a prostitute. But if you look at some of the translations, it says 
that it may have just been that she was an innkeeper. And if you look at the point of bring your whole family into this room and leave the cord hanging outside the window, your family will be saved from uh, the resulting attack. And lo and behold, she brings in her mother, her father, other family members. And it's like, really, would prostitutes have that kind of family line? So she was the second one. Ruth is the third. And the final female in the genealogy of Jesus that's listed is Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. Probably not Jewish, but as you well know, David had quite a bit of problems because of his lusting after her. But all these people, all these ladies, are included in the genealogy of Jesus which says God can still use us today, no matter what our backgrounds. There's a lot more examples in the, in the genealogy of Jesus to show imperfection doesn't matter to God. It's the heart that we have. And so now with that said, we're still doing good, aren't we? I can't see the timer on the clock. So 22 minutes. Okay. We're going to move on to Samuel. Samuel is the last great judge of Israel. And it's really a, a fun thing to look at his beginning story, although it's also hard to imagine. His mama was married apparently to a priest, and the priest's name was Elkanah. And he was married to two people at once. No brother ministers. It doesn't mean we can have more than one wife now. Probably uh, not even a good idea. Uh -huh. Whether or not you want to. Anyway, his name was Elkanah, and he had two wives. And let me get the right one. Hannah was the wife who had no children. Well, she went to, every year her husband would go to offer sacrifices uh, where the temple, of, tent of where the tent of meeting was at, and the altar, of course. And she was praying one evening in front of Eli, the high priest, who was nearly, if not completely blind. He couldn't have been completely blind yet because he saw her mouth moving. She was praying in her heart, but just sort of the way I read sometimes, <laughs> I will read to myself and I'll manage to move my mouth around some words. Well, she was doing that in prayer, asking for a son, and she made a promise that if God gave her a son, she would give him back to the Lord. Children were truly considered a possession. Now, it was not the wife's position to say that, but she did. And, uh, and it was honored. After she became pregnant, and she took this little boy after weaning him, so probably between the age of two and three, not totally sure. But she took him back and presented him to Eli, the priest, and he stayed. The little baby Samuel stayed with Eli from that point forward. I envision little Eli running around the temp little temple, Samuel. the tent. Little Samuel. Little Samuel running uh, around Eli, Eli. with the tent, and he's in a robe and slippers. Just a three-year-old kid running around. I love it. Uh, as a grandpa, I just think it's phenomenal. But he grows up. Eli's sons did not end up being very good priests. In fact, quite the contrary. And they were killed. Uh, Eli, and when Eli died, the leadership of the kingdom moved over to Samuel. Read these portions. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, it's the first book of Samuel. But you get in there and you see these things. Samuel grows up. He's high priest judging. He makes regular rounds. He doesn't just stay in one place. Pastors, he didn't stay in his office waiting for people to come to him. He went out to people to judge. And uh, to be. Circuit writer. He was. Yeah. He's the first recorded circuit writer. We have chaplains before that. It's yes. a different story. But we have Samuel doing that. People call for a king. They don't want a judge. He's getting older. 
his sons are not behaving the way they should. There's a reason why preacher's kids have a bad reputation. Could be. Uh, it doesn't appear that they were as bad as Eli's son. But nonetheless, the people call for a king, and Samuel gets to anoint the first two. And the first one was Saul. We all know that. And Saul was physically the perfect example of a king for Israel. Only because he was not bad looking, but he was head and shoulders above taller than everybody else in Israel. So he was a physical commanding type, right. but he was really a pygmy when it comes to spirituality. And he does some things that we don't even learn about until the, toward the end of 2 Samuel. Uh, but still, we have this example that he disobeys God. He does things he's not supposed to. He takes charge on his own instead of relying on God and relying on the high priest for help. And he loses his kingdom that way. It is taken from him. Not physically right away, mind you, but it's taken away from him. And God tells Samuel, go to Bethlehem city. Of, yeah, not the city of David yet. No. Bethlehem, and you're going to anoint one of the sons of Jesse. And one, Samuel, yes, Samuel is really angry and disappointed that the one he anointed as king doesn't count that simple, yeah. but he does what God wants him to do. That's a message for all of us. Please be doing what God says. Right. No matter how you feel about it. Yeah. Because it may not God's, seem right. God's to plan you, is right. That's why it's so important to pray before you start planning. Yes. And of course, we have to put the side notes on there if it's in agreement with the Bible. If somebody or something tells you to jump off the world, I know it's physically impossible, but if they were to go to that extreme or even go jump off a thousand foot cliff, that is not keeping with the Bible. So right. be careful. You have to honestly look and see what scripture says about it. Old and New Testament examples. And they have to be looked at it from that way. Uh, but anyway, Samuel goes and finds Jesse. He calls for a special sacrifice and meal. Samuel is. And Jesse is invited and his sons are invited. And seven of his sons make it. Or is David the seventh son? Now that I think that out loud. You and I don't remember. Yeah, I'd have to go through and count. Yep. They start off physically pleasing and Samuel will say this one Lord no nope, don't judge on the outside goes through all the sons of Jesse who are present and God tells Samuel no it's none of these so Samuel has to ask Jesse do you have any more he said oh yeah my youngest son David he's out in the field and uh, Samuel says send for him and when David comes he is anointed by Samuel to be the next king. Nowhere does it say, by the way, you'll be next king next Tuesday. Right. We're not, it's not designated just that you'll be the next king. Sometimes God says this thing will happen, but not yet. The way the stories progress after this portion, because I'm not going to do much more, is the fact that I don't think David's brothers were allowed in where David was anointed. Hmm. I base that on the fact that later on, uh, when it comes to the battle just before Goliath, David's brothers are certainly not acting like he the future king. <laughs> They're acting like he's just this bratty brat. little brother. Thank you, bratty, yeah. bratty little brother. Good although, descriptor. Go although I would like to point out that there are plenty of examples in the Bible of people who see something but don't understand what it means. We have tons of example in, examples in the Gospels. Um, I mean, the, the, the disciples 
apostles saw all these miracles and all these things. You know, they, they see Jesus feed. Which one was first, the 4,000? And then they don't know what to do when it comes time to feed the 5,000. It's 5, like they forgot. And then, oh, fives and four. Okay. Yeah, it does seem rather strange, yeah. doesn't it? So, um, so, yeah. So, and Jesus literally tells them he's going to die. And they don't get it when he gets taken away to go be killed for, uh, um, to be sacrificed for our sins. Between you and Rudy, we've got lots of topics today. <laughs> yeah, we do. Uh, and we, they're not rabbit trails. They're good stories to fall up on so that you can see and understand it for yourselves. But here we are with Samuel. He, pardon me, he anoints David. And then you'd think that Samuel would be done, but he's not. Uh, he works with Saul a little while, but then he stops interacting with Saul at all until an amazing story at the end of Sam, not the end of Samuel's life, no. after yes. Samuel's life has ended. Saul is being more and more, uh, what do I want to say? Uh, Full of himself? No, that's not the word. I'm sorry, but anxious. Okay. Anxiety is rising up. He's becoming more and more fearful. That's a good scripture for it, too. Uh, and he is very concerned about what's happening or going to happen. And he's about to go into his last battle before he gets killed. And he goes to a medium. Now, no jokes aside, he goes to somebody who claims they can talk to the dead. And if you read that story, you'll find that he didn't go to somebody who could talk to the dead at all. Because once she talks to him and says, all right, who do you want me to call up? And he says, Samuel. And we are told that Samuel, she sees Samuel, and he comes up out of the ground. So there's a whole series of messages in here that I have to do quickly. Mm -hmm. But Samuel talks to Saul in absolute understandable terms, but he has to ask Saul, why did you do this? So we have an example of when people went down from paradise, they didn't necessarily get to see what was going on in everyday life that was still going on. So we may not be able to see what goes on after we're raised up. And that's a whole series. Uh, the next point is, is that she was the medium, was absolutely shocked out of her socks. Yeah. Uh, sandals anyway. Uh, because she had never had this experience before. Mm -hmm. And that is truly a good point for us to say, well, what is going on with these people who say they are not just clairvoyant, but who claim they can talk to the dead and bring them back and whatnot? Uh, it's really very important. But it shows the issue of Samuel coming out of the ground, not down from heaven. And I think that truly is an important part for us to realize. Before Jesus went up to heaven, nobody else was up there with two exceptions that we can't explain. And that's Enoch in the first chapters of Genesis. That's before the flood with Noah. He walked with God and was no more. It appears that he never died. And the prophet Elijah, who's the next one we get into, but I don't know if we have time. Yeah, uh, we do. Uh, okay, and Elijah, who's taken up by a whirlwind, and he does not see death. Those are the only two people who don't see full death before Jesus. Jesus even experienced death, and then he showed that he could conquer it. The best sermon around. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, do you have anything you'd like to add about Samuel at this point, Bill? No. The, uh, other than there are some great bits and pieces of his story that we didn't go through and uh, about uh, um, that, that talk about how we should answer the Lord's call. Um, and yeah, just how uh, how to 
act on uh, on what the Lord tells us because uh, Samuel is very faithful. Yeah. So read Samuel, First Samuel. First Samuel. Uh, originally, the book of Samuel was written as one book. Right. He dies somewhere before the end of First Samuel, and so it's always been a wonder. Well, who was it who really wrote the rest of First Samuel and Second Samuel? We're not going to discuss that one today. But here we have the last judge, and his examples are well worth reading in 1 Samuel. All right, we're moving on again following Catherine Slavery's list to, do I really want to say the greatest of the prophets? I don't think so. Uh, Elijah was a great prophet. We do not have any writings or books from Elijah. So there are some really good things by other people, uh, but he was nonetheless a prophet of God. And he came about during the time of the divided kingdom, and he did some amazing miracles, including uh, helping save the northern kingdom, which had turned bad, but God was not willing to give up on them. Um, he had a contest that really goes <laughs> out of, of amazing time. Yes. There were uh, prophets who were obviously against God. They wanted to be prophets of Baal, King Ahab, and yes, his wife, Queen Jezebel. Uh, who's so evil. How evil is she? What's she? She, she is now named for evil, <laughs> evil itself. Yes. Jezebel, well, no, let's start with Elijah suggests a contest between Baal and God. And there's some 500 prophets of Baal that are there. And he allows them the contest for this is at the end, well, near the end of a three-year famine with no rain. And it's on the Mount Carmel, or Carmel. And Elijah, I think very sarcastically, said, why don't you go ahead and let the 500 go first and let them uh, set everything up. And they're going to set up their sacrifices. They are going to pray and call on their God to bring down fire to burn that sacrifice. And basically, it just doesn't happen. Yes, they build the, the altar. They put the sacrifice on there. They jump around calling on their God, Baal, to bring fire out, down on this, and nothing happens. All By, the while, Elijah is sarcastically in, encouraging them. It's haunting them, for <laughs> yes. sure. Perhaps taunting. he's asleep. Perhaps he's on, on a trip. I'll call harder, and, and by noontime, the prophets of Baal even start offering self-blood sacrifices, which is just grody to me. Yes. Uh, but they were doing it. That's how fanatical they were. Well, we still see fanatical people uh, in the world today, for Christ even, that do much more than the Bible ever tells us. Those are people who aren't praying about what they should be doing. Yeah. And that happens throughout the day till about, well, it says about the time of the ninth hour sacrifice of prayers, as I recall. And by the way, this is at the end of 1 Kings. If you want the reference, that's as close as I'll get you. Because the story of Elijah takes several chapters, just like his predecessor will. Uh, but we won't get into it. Elijah waits and then very quietly, systematically builds his altar. He cuts up the sacrifice, places it on the altar, and then he calls for water, which if you aren't sure what's going on, if it's a three-year famine, how do you do this? But he gets Mount Carmel's by the Mediterranean. And so people are bringing water up to him, and he douses the sacrifice and he had built trenches around and he literally kept pouring water till these trenches even were full and then he turns to God and he prays to God once and fire comes down and totally eats up all that soaked sacrifice and the soaked wood 
and all the water, the salt water, but nonetheless, all that water, and it's gone. And with that, the 500 priests of Baal were killed. Well, no good deed goes unpunished, or at least threatened to be punished. When Isabel, Isabel, that's my granddaughter, forgive me, darling, when Jezebel hears about this, she threatens to have Elijah killed. And he becomes fearful. And we're told in the Bible that, I'm sorry I left out part of the story, after the sacrifice and the killing of the Baal priest, Elijah goes to a mountaintop. He prays until a cloud is seen off in the distance by his servant. And when the cloud is seen, he says, that's enough. Praying, he uh, tells King Ahab to get home because rain's coming. And then he proceeds to outrun the king's chariot, which is mind boggling. He goes to, he gets fed by ravens. He goes to a cave. He goes through a terrible uh, period of depression. And, yeah, tragic depression. And he thinks he's forgotten, actually, that he was told by one of the servants of Ahab who was looking for him that this that servant had saved 500 Jewish priests and kept them hidden and fed in caves so that they would not get killed by Ahab and Jezebel's orders. Uh, but anyway, he's so depressed about all that, he forgets it, and he tells God, please take my life. I can't handle this anymore. Sound familiar to anyone? If it does, contact us. Let us help. Or find your pastor and ask them for help. There's no room for suicide in Christianity. I know good and well that I've considered those things briefly over the years for different reasons, but it simply isn't the route to go, okay? Uh, then he asked if he can see God, and God said, well, you can see me, but you can't see my face because you will die. You can compare that to Moses. No, Moses was an exception, but... This is where Elijah is told to step out of the cave. Apparently it's a high up cave with a canyon. And God does, let's see, how is it? Thunder, mm -hmm. earthquake? Thunder, earthquake, fire? Fire, and then a still small voice. Right. And Elijah hears that still small voice and it's overpowering. He literally covers his ears and runs back into the cave. Then God sort of promises Elijah that he will be with him in heaven very soon. He gives him three tasks. You can read about those tasks. One of them, though, is to call Elisha. Right. And after Elijah has done those tasks, he goes where God directs him. Elisha goes with him. And Elijah is then taken up in the heaven by a whirlwind, not in a chariot, even though the chariot's there and the horse of, of, of God, but he's lifted up and taken to heaven where, what can I say, lives till today? Yeah. I know he's up there. I don't know if I understand the concept of what living in heaven would be like, but he's there. I wanted to touch on something. Please. Um, Jezebel had threatened to kill uh, Elijah um, after he defeated her prophets, the, the prophets of Baal. And this is an example of how entrenched someone can get in their beliefs, no matter how wrong they may be. Yeah. That when someone proves them wrong, they don't change their minds. They get angry about it because for many reasons. I mean, we, we could go for a, we could go for a while on the psychology of, uh, of cults and and uh, and the worship of, uh, of false gods, but and we need to remember that that can happen to someone today. So be careful when you approach someone who has a different set of beliefs that you do. Not saying don't tell them the truth, but be careful how you present the truth to them, because they're entrenched and uh, probably entrenched. 
and uh, which is a good quality because you want them to be entrenched for Jesus. But uh, you have to be careful how it's presented because they can instantly and totally reject you and reject the concepts that you've presented and reject Jesus and go further into the hole they've uh, they've dug for themselves. Maybe one of these days we'll do uh, we'll do a talk on how to uh, how to talk to people of different beliefs. That could be a multi-part series because there's so many different sure. beliefs out there. And oh yes, there are so many different ways to talk to them. But we'll finish with this right now yes. and reference of Romans chapter 14. And that was really uh, talking about how we should treat others in their situations and being a, when we can, being able to support them as best we can. You know, if you don't eat, if you eat meat and you are visiting someone who doesn't eat meat, don't hold it against them. Uh, the same thing, in my opinion, about drinking, not illegal drugs. I'm not going there today. Uh, but it's also about their faith. You have a strong faith. You keep a strong faith. If they mention something that's keeping with the Bible and you like it, adapt it. And if for some reason someone shows you a better way, like uh, shucks, <laughs> husband and wife, Priscilla and Aquila, mm -hmm. they met with Apollos. Thank you. <laughs> They met with Apollos, who had only known the baptism of John, and they taught him more about Jesus, and he became a very strong advocate for Jesus after that. He was adaptable. We should be adaptable mm -hmm. and being able to say, well, I can do this or I can do without this while I am in the presence of these individuals. Well, that's true of those who are not Christians as well. There are things that you absolutely should not copy, but there are things that you might say, you know what, that's not against the Bible. Maybe it's a good thing. And you have to honestly pray about it and consider it. And I think we're done for today, Bill. Okay. Am I past? Am I no, past time? We're, we're, we're right about on time. Okay. So, um, so I still I haven't had a chance to write it down yet since uh, since we last talked about it. <laughs> but uh, if you've come this far with us, gentle listener, gentle viewer, perhaps you will come a little bit further with us and join us in this family we call Christianity. We do this not with magical spells or mystical ceremonies because that's not how we roll. But uh, um, we do uh, uh, we do many of us in in the Protestant uh, side of the faith say a thing called the sinner's prayer. Um, now, this is it's in itself is not a golden ticket to magically whisk you away to heaven. Um, it's not a free pass. And, uh, um, you know, just saying these words don't doesn't have any effect on its own. The Bible tells us that if you believe in your heart and speak with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. So it's the overflow of your heart that we're looking for, that you're looking for, that God is looking for. That uh, um, if you believe in your heart that Jesus has died and rose from the dead to save you from your sins, and you are so excited about that you can't help but say it, then that's that's what uh, what this is. And this is just a way. The sinner's prayer is just a way to help you express that. Um, of course, uh, whatever you express, the Holy Spirit uh, translates into moanings and groanings that we can't understand. Anyway, so uh, so it all gets changed around, <laughs> but it still means the same thing. So if you'll join with me um, as I say the sinner's prayer, then uh, um, remember the sinner's. Oh yeah, remember the sinner's prayer is not in the Bible, um, but there are biblical principles to base it on, and uh, so these are words that made sense to me when I wrote them down. Uh, well, I when I came up with them. I haven't written them down on paper yet. And <laughs> um, But if you're already a believer, uh, use this time to uh, to pray, to seek God's guidance in your plans and goals, to ask for forgiveness for uh, for sins uh, that you've committed since the last time you prayed. And uh, and we'll use this time together. So, uh, so here we go. Dear Lord, I am a sinner. Cleanse me of my wickedness. Show me the path you would have me take in this world and guide my steps as I 
trying my best to take it. Help me to do the work you would have me do for the building of your kingdom, and come into my heart and be the Lord and Savior. And all these things we pray and more in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And there we have it. So, um, so welcome to the uh, to the family. And uh, um, next thing to do would be to find yourself a Bible believing church with a Bible preaching pastor with a lot of strong Christians in the congregation to help you figure out your next steps because we are told to uh, to assemble and uh, and join with others and well this is not the end of your path but the beginning of it and you need to figure out what's going to be next and one of the things that i hope will be next on your path will be to watch more shows of uh, ywl online we will have another uh, new episode of uh, uh, the All Approachable Bible Study for All on Tuesday, where we'll go into a deep dive into uh, more of Matthew, and uh, we'd like to cover history and uh, language and culture and all the things that help us understand what the Bible means by what it says. And uh, if you've missed any past episodes of YWL Online, you can just scroll on down on the page here and uh, find it, and uh, then you can catch up. And if you have anything on your heart, mind, or kidneys, uh, feel free to reach out. You know, we're happy to pray with you, pray for you, um, point you in uh, the right direction for, uh, for help you may need if, uh, if you need it. Well, with that, uh, I'll ask you fine gentlemen if you have any final words for the nice people. Please, everybody, if you're feeling depressed, talk to somebody or go seek help. And remember, you're not alone. God bless you and love you all. Waka waka with the Lord. Waka waka indeed. And God's blessing from here in Branson. Yes, indeed. Be safe out there. Be sure to wash your hands and stay tuned for the ending credits. Thank you all for tuning in. This has been a presentation of Bald Spots Productions. I'd like to thank our producer, my beloved mother, Eileen Hatch. I, of course, am your humble host. I would also like to thank my co-host and mentor, my beloved father, the happy chap, Chaplain Bill Hatch. I'm similarly thankful for my Ed McMahon, Rudy Corlew. Yes! Support the show if you feel so led over on Patreon.com. We're known as Bald Spots Pro. Don't you dare miss Not Quite After Midnight. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube, and wherever fine podcasts are offered. Be sure to like, comment, and share. You know, subscribe, follow, whatever it is you've got to do to kick that algorithm into gear and help us reach more people. If you or someone you know needs support now, call or text 988 or chat 988lifeline.org. That is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline here in the United States. 